The video you are about to see commemorates Elliot Carter's sixth visit to Toronto as a guest of New Music Concerts. We are delighted to have this opportunity to celebrate his 100th anniversary. In all the years I've known Elliot, not once has he complained about the metric relationship between one temple and the other one. He's just concerned, as all great musicians are, really with color, dynamics, and the meaning. And so all these aspects are more important to him than all of these other things. And my greatest fears disappeared with that first visit. Now, Elliot is very, very particular about dynamics. I was sitting at home one night having supper, and the phone rang, and it was Elliot Carter phoning from New York, and he said, you know, Bob, in that 45th bar where I have that piano E, maybe it would be better to make it a mezzo piano. And I thought, good heavens. This is like six weeks after the piece was composed, and he's still fine-tuning and being concerned with such tiny details as a mezzo piano or a piano on a staccato E. This is the kind of man he is, extremely concerned with the finest, finest things, and he knows the instruments very well. The challenges of performing Carter is the same as performing all great composers, as one needs to find exactly the right color dynamic and shaping of the phrase for the performance to succeed. Also, if you begin a piece too fast or too slow, too loud or too soft, it is difficult to change it, it's difficult to correct it, because everything is related to everything else in his music, and how the piece begins really determines how it ends. Anything else? <laughs> for many years, flute players have been anxious to have a work from Elliot Carter for their instrument. His writing style needs counterpoint. It needs a lot of activity. And until that time, his only pieces for chamber music have involved a lot of counterpoint. Well, I was uh, in Europe teaching where I have been for the last few years. And he phoned me up and asked if I'd like to join them for supper, which I did. We uh, talked again about possibility of writing a piece for flute, and he was humming and hawing, and I explained to him, well, why don't you write the last movement for the Bach solo sonata? I was back in Toronto three weeks later, and the phone rang, and Elliot said, well, it's just about done. He named it Scrivo Invento, which was the name of one of Petrarch's many sonnets, and then a few days after the premiere, we took him for a drive to uh, Fontaine de Vaucluse, where the poet actually lived. My daughter Diane said, Look, Elliot, my father played the premiere of your piece on Petrarch's birthday. Just by chance, total chance, the premiere of the piece was on his birthday. question about dialogues. How deeply and at what level of detail did the metaphor of conversation guide the composition of the piece? Professionals are musicians. They've learned music just as you might have learned French or, or Japanese. There's always a conversation between composers and musicians just because of this, this tra professional training. It's just a matter of of familiarity, you know. I used to speak Greek, but I'd, I've forgotten it, <laughs> but I don't forget music. You do read a lot, and you have a great knowledge of literature. Uh, and you have many titles and many pieces which relate to literature, and how does the influence of these books, these poems, and so on, actually transmit into your creative process. I think in, in every case, it's, a, it's very, every one of the things you might ask me about in, the, in, in, in this list of pieces is done in a different way. 
The concert of orchestra, for instance, was based, based, had a relationship with the, the, the French poem Winds of, of, of St. Jean Perse. And then I thought, well, you know, this is so much like what I'm writing, I would use, I would f f shape the piece a little bit as those poem, the poem goes, but the, the idea for the piece was there before the, mu the poem. <laughs> I wrote a piece for Oliver Nusson called OK, which of course is his capital, uh, a ca a capital uh, his what he called acronym, OC, OK, I mean. And I found an article by Schoenberg about OK and why it's called uh, OK, and that is in French, OK. And, and the story is <laughs> the people, the, the French town ran out to, the, out to see whether their people were coming home on the boats, the and boats. when they did, okay. they yelled, OK, OK. <laughs> <laughs> what are you reading at the moment? Oh, well, I'm, I'm reading rapidly. I never have before, and I find it extremely <laughs> surprising and, and entertaining. In old French. Well, I have a French, old French on one side, and new French on the other. Uh, well, it's translated I, from old French to new French. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> I can read the old French, but it's uh, they're, they're especially rather indecent words, and not very clear to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, and you, and you know you know them in the new French, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> For instance, now the other one, the recent one, the PPI, the piano piece I wrote for. Peter Serkin is called Intermittences. And in this case, it is a, uh, I've been reading Ch uh, Marcel Proust, and there's a, a chapter called Intermittences of the Heart. And it is all about his going somewhere and going to the beach after his grandmother had died, who had gone with him the previous time, and he remembers all the different things that they had did and said to each other, and how kind she was. Though all the memory, as it is in his Bruce, all of this comes up when he starts to button his shoe. In those days, they button shoes. <laughs> and, and the grandmother used to help him button his shoe, and he <laughs> suddenly remembers this wonderful paragraph, many pages describing how she had dealt with him when he was younger and how she helped him. And I, I thought that was an interesting idea. Now, I don't think my piece actually buttons the shoe, but it, <laughs> <laughs> it sort of suggests things of this sort a little bit. Both of these pieces, when we began to rehearse them, I thought, what an unusual form, especially mosaic as a, as a piece of music, very unusual form, and I wondered, where it came from. It wasn't stream of consciousness, I don't think. Ah. Well, you and know, it's balanced uh, by the long harp You have to allow the composer some end. freedom, you know. Yeah, yeah, to create, you mean, <laughs> freedom to create <laughs> right. without restrictions. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I can't tell you. I don't know why I wrote it that way exactly. Yeah. The, the, there was no preconceived form. There was obviously, as you listen and and you now that you make me think about it, it was obviously I was thinking that there would be sections in which the harp would play alone, play rather elaborately alone, and I thought, well, maybe those poor other people ought to do something too. That's it. <laughs> I mean, that's part of the way I think. You but know, I, too one many of the people. <laughs> I, I hate to have all those musicians sitting around not doing anything, and I like to give them something that will amuse them or interest them to play. Yes, you and often that, that's said in that. my head too. You know, like many other nutty things. Mosaic seems to be a work of naturalist abstraction. Was there, in fact, a direction from nature in this piece? 